When it comes to studying inverse functions, the inverse hyperbolic functions present a very good case, something very interesting to study. Now we have in front of us Sinch and Koch, uh, their graphs in fact, and so we can start by asking ourselves from the graphs, can we conclude whether the inverse functions exist or not? Well, if we look at Sinch x, we can see that it passes the horizontal line test, and we can use the properties of graphs of inverse functions to see what the graph of the inverse should look like. Well, it should look like this, the reflection around the diagonal of the original function. So yes, we conclude that this inverse of sinh x exists. How about cosh x? Well, cosh x obviously is not invertible. It does not pass the, ver the horizontal line test. And therefore, the first thing that we need to do is restrict its domain. As uh, we will be doing on a customary basis, we're going to restrict the domain to the simplest case, namely to positive values of x. So this is the restricted domain version of cosh x. Now this is invertible. And again, we're going to use the property of graphs to draw what the inverse of cosh x should look like. All right, so now we have arrived at the conclusion that Sinch has an inverse, Koch has an inverse as long as we restrict the domain to positive values only, or of course we can throw in zero as well. But the question is, do we stop here as was done for sine and cosine? Remember, for sine and cosine, we cannot actually find a formula, and therefore all we can do is define these inverses being the inverse sine and the inverse cosine. But Sinch and Koch do have a formula, and they have a formula which is written in terms of exponentials, and by now we know how to invert the exponential by using logarithms. So, can we extend all that to finding formula for Sinch and Koch? Of course the answer is yes, and here is how it is done. So let's start from um, finding inverse sinh of x. As I said, this one exists. We don't need any restriction on the domain of sinh. Uh, and again, we can find a formula. Now, not only that, but actually finding the formula is a great exercise in algebra because it allows us to use a number of algebraic techniques that uh, maybe they are a little bit rusty or maybe a little bit weak. So uh, hopefully you're going to be able to acquire some gems of algebra technique as uh, well as finding the inverse of sin check. So let's see how it's done. So first of all, we're going to start from the original, which is invertible. And I hope you remember that the formula for sin x is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. So all of that, of course, is going to be equal to our y, our output variable. And now we're going to follow the usual technique for finding the inverse. So we're going to do that by first solving for x, then switching. So we're going to start by eliminating the denominator. And by the way, this is a very good general algebraic technique when you're trying to solve equations. If you have denominators, it's often a good idea to get rid of them. That's an easy thing to do. All we have to do is move the 2 to the other side. At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to change the, this equation to a quadratic equation because, of course, we know how to solve quadratic equations. And I can almost see the mouth opening on your face and say, a quadratic equation from there? How are you going to get that? And here is another one uh, of those gems that I was mentioning earlier. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this equation in uh, by using a little uh, standard trick, and I'm going to change it, yes, into something that is a quadratic equation. How do I do that? Well, what I'm doing is I'm noticing that in my equation, remember we're solving for x. In our equation, we have an e to the x and an e to the minus x, which is really a 1 over e to the x. So the e to the minus x really has another denominator, includes another denominator. Well, gets let's get rid of that denominator as well by multiplying left and right side by e to the x. So we multiply the left side by e to the x, the right side by e to the x. On the left hand side, once we uh, expand the product, we end up with e to the 2x minus 1, because of course e to the x times e to the minus x is the same as e to the 0, which is 1, equals 2 e to the xy. Now we're going to move everything to the left hand side. All right, there it is. And now, can you see that this thing is a quadratic equation? If not, I'm going to write it in a different way. Remember, e to the 2x is the same thing as e to the x squared, right? And now, you can I hope you can clearly see that this is a quadratic equation in e to the x, right? So what I can do is I can use the quadratic formula to solve for e to the x, and then we'll move from there. Uh, if you're a little bit surprised by all these sequence of steps, you may want to rewind and watch it again, but I'll keep moving on. 
All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to solve for e to the x using the quadratic formula. So that tells us that e to the x is going to be equal to minus b, which in our case is 2y. Remember, y is part of the coefficients here. Now the equation is in e to the x. Everything else is coefficients. And then it's plus or minus the square root of b squared, which would be 4y squared, minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is negative 1. So we end up with a plus 4. All right, now there's lots of things that we can uh, put together and cancel. In fact, we can simplify by doing what? Well, look at those four numbers. We can take the two fours which are under the square root, factor them out, take them out of the root so it becomes a two outside of the root. Now we have a two y and a two outside of the root. We can factor those out and cancel them with the two in the bottom. I'm not going to show you how to do it because that's something you should be familiar with and everybody will expect you to be familiar with, but if you're not sure about it, do it two or three times until you're very comfortable with it. All right, so at this point, what we end up with is e to the x equal y plus or minus square root of y squared plus one. But now we have a problem. What is that plus or mi minus doing there for us? Remember, we're looking for a function. We cannot end up with two different values for each value of y, right? Uh, this is supposed to be an invertible function. For each y, we're supposed to get a unique value for, for x. So the plus or minus is giving us a problem. But on the other hand, let's think about it. The square root of y squared plus 1 is definitely going to be bigger than y, right? Because the square root of y squared is going to be equal to y. So the square root of y squared plus 1 is bigger than y. So if we consider the negative in the plus or minus, we would end up with a negative number because we would end up with y minus a number bigger than y. But on the left hand side, we have e to the x, which is an exponential. Therefore, it's got to be positive. And therefore, what we can do is we can use the fact that exponentials are positive, get rid of the plus or minus, and conclude that e to the x has to be equal to y plus square root of y squared plus 1. At this point now, getting x is quite easy. All we have to do is apply logarithms on both sides, of course, natural logarithms. And so what we end up with is x equal ln of all that expression in there. We're not done yet because, of course, we have solved for x, but we still have to switch x and y. So we're going to do that. We're going to switch x and y, and we end up with y equals inverse inch of x is equal to ln of all that quantity. And of course, if you look at this formula, you'll realize that by switching x and y, we have obtained y, which to begin with was the inverse sinh of uh, x. And on the other hand, y is going to be the ln of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. So that is the formula that we were looking for. So now we have a formula for inverse sinh of x. Let's see how the same thing can be done with inverse cosh. Well, it's exactly the same uh, uh, process, except that remember, we have to restrict the domain. And that's going to prove very, very important and very useful as we do that. So let's start by doing that. So remember, this is the formula for cosh x, e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. And that is our uh, graph. So what we need to do is we need to restrict the domain. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to do that by taking only the positive values of x. So we're going to take all the left hand side away. And that means that we're going to consider x greater than or equal to 0. So keep that in mind, because that's going to be crucial in one step uh, in a moment. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to solve as we did before. So that means we start by saying, OK, we have our y equals e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. We're going to solve for x. So we're going to eliminate the denominators. And I'm switch left and right hand side for convenience. Then we're going to multiply everything by e to the x, just like we did before. Then I'm going to rearrange into a quadratic equation, just like we did before. And then we're going to solve by using the quadratic formula. And here again, what I can do is we have two fours under the square root. We can factor, take it out of the root, factor with the two in the top, simplify with the two in the bottom. Again, this is a kind of algebraic operations that we expect you to be able to do quickly and efficiently. So I'm not going to dwell on it, but and it's the last time I say that, uh, but you practice on it. And so all of that becomes uh, y plus or minus square root of y squared minus 1. Now we have the same problem as before, the plus or minus part. How are we going to get rid of that one? This is where we're going to use our restriction, because x greater than or equal to 0 implies that e to the x has to be greater than or equal to 1. You can actually check that the right hand side uh, can only be greater than or equal to 1 if we use the plus. 
think about it this way. Remember, y is the output of the original uh, function, the Cauch function at this point, and we know that that's always one or more. Well, if that is the case, the square root of y squared minus one ends up being closer and closer to y, and therefore y minus something which is almost equal to y is going to be less than one. That's a bit of a hand-waving kind of argument, but you can check it maybe on your calculator, just graph that function and notice that uh, for y greater than one, the y minus the square root of y squared minus one is always less than one. That cannot happen. And what this means is that just like we did for cinch, uh, the pr proper formula here for the inverse Cauch it will involve a positive. And now the last step is just like before. So we're going to write that x is equal to the logarithm of the expression we have found out. And now finally we're going to switch x and y and come up with the formula for inverse Cauch x, which is given by the ln of x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. So again, uh, this allows us to get formula for these inverse uh, Sinch and Cauch functions, and those formula will, will come in handy later on in other applications. But also, again, remember, it's a good thing to remember that these hyperbolic functions have similar, fun similar properties to uh, trig functions, but they do have one advantage, that of being defined through formulae.